On this week's GCN Racing News Show, an insight into the superhuman power and speed of Jeffrey Hoagland. He smashed the one kilometer individual time trial world record last week. The numbers are going to make you weep. I'll also be wrapping up all the action from the UCI Track Champions League and two big cyclocross races from last week. This week in the world of racing, we learned that if you're going to get lapped in a cyclocross race, you may as well stand back and applaud as the leader comes through. That was Jo Blanchard giving Fen van Empel a clap on her way to the Koppenberg Cross victory on Wednesday. We also learned that there is something that today Pogaccia isn't good at. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned because later in the show we'll be showing you the efforts of Sepp Kuss, Mark Cavendish and Peter Sagan. They were um, mixed, I think I should say. And finally, we learned that Jeffrey Hoagland has smashed the one kilometre individual time trial world record. He was in Aguascalientes in Mexico last week and posted a time of 55.433 seconds, which took almost nine tenths of a second off the previous best. That was set by Francois Purvis 10 years ago. Uh, that time meant that Hoagland averaged just under 65 kilometers per hour from a standing start. That is in excess of 40 miles per hour. And this breakdown by Xavier Dislip, aero coach, gives us a bit more insight into the incredible speeds he got to. So the first lap was almost exactly the same time as he did at the World Championship qualification earlier this year. But it's after that that the speed ramps up. As Disley points out, that's probably due to the lower air density at altitude, but let's not take anything away from his performance, particularly since the previous record was also set in the same venue. By the end of lap two of the track, he did his peak cruising speed, 74.9 kilometers per hour, or 46 and a half miles per hour. But that was his average speed over half a lap of the track, or 125 meters. So in reality, his peak speed would have been a little higher than that. That's got to be giving you some G-force going around the track, hasn't it? And when you look at the video of the record on Hoagland's social media, it looks as bonkers as it sounds. When he goes into the corners on the banking, it almost looks like the video has been sped up. How do you even keep control of your bike in a velodrome at that speed? It's beyond me. And now next time you're descending, I would suggest that you take a quick glance at your speed when it's safe to do so, and compare that to the speeds reached by Hoagland, and that will give you some sort of an appreciation for just how incredible his achievement is. Now, according to the Dutch website NOS, Hoagland spent more time in the gym than on his bike in preparation for these record attempts, and that was pushing out 650 kilogram leg presses for weeks on end. Absolutely incredible. Now, we don't have the power data, but according to a podcast that he was on in the week before the attempt, the plan was to peak at 2,700 watts and to still be holding in excess of 900 watts by the finish. So an average power well in excess of 1,000 watts for that 55 seconds. He may be close to 100 kilograms, but that is still mightily impressive nonetheless. Such was the effort of Hoagland that even 10 minutes after he'd finished, he was still sat on the floor on the verge of being sick. Massive well done to Jeffrey Hoagland, who had to fund and organize pretty much all of the record attempt on his own. Uh, what a shame, actually, that the event is no longer an Olympic one in its own right. Uh, it seems appropriate now, though, that we move on to the latest round of the UCI Track Champions League, as it was the third round of the series in Paris on Saturday evening. Uh, Hoagland's rival countryman Harry Lovrason was once again on great form, although his 100% record was finally broken by last year's sprint champion Matty Richardson. Now that sprint final was tense. Track stands galore before the Australian hit out early and managed to keep Le Racing behind him out of the final corner. It's fair to say he gets everything out of himself in every race he does, Richardson. In fact, some of it ended up in a bag. We can't show you that though, even though it was sick. Sorry. Uh, Le Racing would go on to take a convincing win in the Cairn, so any hint that he's slowing down somewhat was shut down straight away. The women's sprint could come down to the wire this week in London. Les Andrews won the match sprint ahead of Kelsey Mitchell, uh, but was well beaten in the Cairn by Alessa Catriona Propster. Just nine points now separate the two at the top of the standings. It was a great night if you happened to be a Canadian endurance rider. Dylan Bibich and Matthias Guillemet went 1-2 in the men's scratch race before Sarah Van Dam and Maggie Coles-Lister repeated the feat in the women's scratch race. And no, Coles-Lister hadn't defected to New Zealand, so she had to borrow a stealth skin suit after her luggage didn't make it with her on the flight over to Paris. 
Bibic would go on to take the elimination race two for a 40 point maximum for the round and the overall lead. Uh, Aya Hashimoto, the previous race leader, notched a big fat zero after dropping out first in the elimination. I mean, there's work to do in London if anyone wants to catch Bibic. The women's elimination race went to the form book, Katie Archibald taking the 20 points there, just as she had done in Berlin and Mallorca. And that was enough to keep the blue jersey on her back, of course. Anita Stenberg is just 12 points behind her, though, thanks to an incredibly consistent series so far from her. On to cyclocross now, and I'll start with the Koppenberg cross before I get onto the European Championships. There, Femme van Empel continued on her unbeaten run of races this season, and in her usual dominating fashion. In the end, she beat Denise Betzmer by close to two minutes on a course that was so brutal, they only completed three full laps. In the men's, it was a much closer race, and coming out on top to take his third big win of the season was Thibaut Nace. His teammate Lars van der Haar got the better of Isabit on the climb to the line to make it a 1-2 for Balois Trek Lions. On to the Europeans then, and there was no action on Saturday due to Storm Chiron. Uh, originally, the races had been scheduled over two days in Pont Chateau in France, but the conditions were too bad even for the hardy cross races to tackle. And so we had all six races yesterday. Zoe Bagstedt and Jenta Michels took the under-23 titles early in the day, and then it was on to the elite women. I will give no prizes to any of you for guessing what happened there if you didn't watch it or see the results. Yes, Fem van Empel sailed away to her seventh victory from seven races so far this cyclocross season. And she makes it look so easy, doesn't she? Her body language and facial expression suggest she's out for a Sunday club run rather than racing at the very highest level. On this occasion, she was just over a minute and a half clear of fellow Dutch woman sailing Del Carmen Alvarado, but it wasn't a clean sweep of the podium for that nation this time. Sarah Casasola of Italy had by far the best result of her career so far to take the bronze medal on the day. In the men's, the Belgians were swarming at the front right from the start, putting almost a complete stranglehold on the early stages of the race. Defending champion Michael Van Turenhout, who has had the best of seasons so far, took the initiative early on, going clear and quickly building an advantage of almost half a minute. With his countrymen defending everything that moved behind him, it put him and the team into a great position. However, as the weather deteriorated, Great Britain's Cameron Mason managed to get some distance on the others and set off in pursuit. With Isabit not looking particularly happy in the cold and wet conditions, two Dutchmen also helped the chase, van der Haar and Ron Haar. Now, I wouldn't say it was panic stations for the Belgian squad, but there was a point in the race where it looked like it could all unravel for them at any moment. However, Van Torenhout held steady at the front and successfully defended his title. Fair play to Cameron Mason, though. Uh, this is a young man who's been steadily making headway over the last few years. He might not have hit the pro category with a bang like some of the recent super talents have, but each year he's improving, and a silver medal at the European Championships is a just reward for that hard work. Now, according to our commentator, Martin McDonald, Mason became the first rider outside of Belgium or the Netherlands to have ever won a medal at the Elite Men's European Cyclocross Championships. Van der Haar had to settle for third place in the end. What's also been great this year in the men's cyclocross is that in the absence of the big three, there hasn't been one dominant rider this season. Last year, Isabit cleaned up quite a lot of the races, but it's been far more open over the first few weeks of this season. Uh, speaking of the big three, Mathieu van der Poel announced his calendar of cross races last week. I will have to wait a while before we see him compete this winter though, because his first race will be on the 22nd of December. From there through to the World Championships in Tabor in February though, he'll have a pretty intense period. Van Aert and Pidcock are yet to reveal their winter programmes. On now to what we've got coming up for you on GCN Plus this week, and I'll start with the UCI Track Champions League. Rounds four and five will take place in London this Saturday and Sunday to conclude the third series. On top of the track, we also have two cyclocross races for you this weekend. The next round of the Super Prestige takes place in Neil on Saturday, and on Sunday it's the third round of the UCI World Cup from Dendermonde. Meanwhile, our documentary this week is hosted by former pro rider Mitch Docker. He set out to follow in the footsteps of Claudio Chiapucci, El Diablo, as he was known. Uh, he'd set out on a crazy solo breakaway on stage 13 of the 1992 Tour de France over the Alps. Uh, that stage was 250 kilometers long with an elevation gain of over 7,000 meters, unheard of in modern Grand Tours. Anyway, Mitch follows the same route on his ride on a replica of Chiapucci's 92 Carrera bike, complete with a heavy steel frame, down tube shifters, and rim brakes. Phil Liggett, Pippa York, Giuseppe Martinelli, and Claudio Chiapucci himself recount an epic day of bike racing and one of the greatest breakaways of all time. Here's a sneak peek.
The great Claudio Chiapucci has not let the side down with an escapade in the Alps we'll talk about for years to come. I was thinking like the bike riders, there's no way you can survive out there, it's impossible. The, the race kicks off too early, half of the peloton risks elimination, and I don't think he got that memo. The man against the mountains, and the peloton were hoping the mountains would win. Unduro, uno que, fin que no lleve, no lleve a ruota, no molaba mai. As he approached Estrier, one last climb, I can only imagine all the goose flesh I'd be getting. It was theatre, pure theatre. 31 years later, I'm going to attempt to replicate that infamous ride. Me versus the mountains. My arms, my legs, I can't breathe. Day I won't forget, that's for sure. I think that the corridor is rare that can try these emotions. Rare. E quel giorno lì è stata una cosa unica nel suo genere. That film is going to be out for all GCN Plus subscribers to watch from tomorrow, or Tuesday, if you're not watching this the day it comes out. In other news, it was the Saitama Criterium in Japan last week. Today, Pugaccia won the race ahead of Sepp Kurs, but I'm going to focus more on the off the bike activities. First up, here was Pugaccia's prize of winning the race a basket of vegetables. And he seems particularly happy with the broccoli, doesn't he? Uh, next up, here's the annual sketching competition, as promised earlier in the show. You've already seen Pagatcha's stick man, but I can now reveal that they weren't all quite that bad. Here's the effort of Mark Cavendish. Here's the effort of Sepp Kuss, quite impressive, I would say. And here is Peter Sagans, not too bad either. I couldn't decipher who won that particular competition, but I think it's safe to say it was not Tadej Pagatcha. I'll finish with a bit of contract news now. Ineos Grenadiers have been busy announcing multiple renewals over the past week. Ben Swift, Brandon Rivera, Omar Fraili, Lawrence De Plus and Kim Hyduck have all extended, as have Luke Rowe and Salvatore Puccio, both of whom have been with the team full-time since 2012. Christian Spirali is going to Corotec Sella Italia after a couple of years with Alps in De Koenig, whilst Human Powered Health have signed up three riders in the form of Silvia Zanardi, Linda Zanetti and Katia Ragusa, who finished second at Paris-Roubaix this year. Beyond that though, it's a bit quieter on the transfer front, as I guess you would expect at this time of year, but Lidl Trek have announced another signing, Mikhail Shah, who will join as DS for 2024. And so that seems like a good place to finish this week. Uh, thanks for watching, everyone. I'm off work for a couple of weeks now, so you'll be in the capable hands of Joe Timms, but I will see you again very soon. Bye for now.